This is the second portion on jet propulsion. If you have any questions as we're going along, please write them down, put an asterisk next to them, and contact me as soon as possible. I'd be happy to answer any questions concerning the lectures or the homework questions. Thrust Specific Fuel Consumption, or TSFC, is very commonly also abbreviated or called just SFC, or just Specific Fuel Consumption. This TSFC is a ratio of two values. It's how much fuel you're burning in an hour compared to how many pounds, how much thrust you're producing. And we're going to do all of these in pounds so we don't have to worry about the units. Um, the formula, TSFC equals fuel flow divided by thrust. I'm going to have some practice problems in the homework for you to do. And there's going to be a test question or two on thrust specific fuel consumption. So you need to be able to do this math. Given two variables, you can crunch and get the third one. No big deal. But it's not the math. It's not like you're going to be figuring out TSFCs on a daily basis as a jet pilot. That's not why I'm making you do this. I'm asking you to do this because you need to understand this concept of specific fuel consumption. It's a great way to compare two engines together. You could have a really small engine and a really large engine, and yet they could have the same thrust-specific fuel consumption. Uh, for instance, if we crunch some numbers in here, where TSFC equals fuel flow in pounds per hour over how much thrust the engine's producing, and we had 0.9 pounds per hour of th fuel burn, that's not very much, for every one pound, that'd give us 0.9. But how often do you have only a, ten, a ni nine tenths of a pound of fuel getting burned? In reality, we're probably going to be burning a thousand pounds per hour of fuel, and the question is, how much thrust is it producing? If it's producing 2,000 pounds of thrust, that's going to be equal to 0 0.5. That'd be the TSFC, or the specific fuel consumption. So at this particular fuel flow, at this particular thrust, this is essentially uh, telling us how efficient the engine is in turning jet fuel into thrust. The lower the TSFC, the less fuel it burns, for the same amount of fuel. For instance, a uh, TSFC of 0.5 versus a TSFC of 0 0.7. 0 0.5 is better. 0 0.5 is lower. That is, we're burning less fuel. The fuel is on the uh, denominator, numerator. Gosh, it's been a long time. It's on the top of the fraction. The smaller that number is, compared to how much thrust you're producing, the more fuel efficient the engine is. So the smaller the number, the lower the TSFC, the better the fuel economy. And of course, the converse is true. The worse the TSFC, the higher, the, the worse TSFC is that it's higher. And there's another example. If we had TSFC equals pounds per hour of fuel flow over pounds per hour of thrust, we could crunch the numbers. So we could put the numbers in and say 0.5 equals the fuel flow, which we don't know what that is, and had 10,000 pounds of thrust. We could solve for fuel flow by multiplying each side by 10,000. If we multiply this side by 10,000, this 10,000 and that 10,000 would cancel out. We'd have 10,000 times 0.5 equals fuel flow, so that'd be 5,000 equals fuel flow. Right. Now, a single engine, a certain engine, is going to have more than one specific fuel consumption or thrust specific fuel consumption. Let's say we have an RPM gauge, for instance, and it's going to go from 0% to, say, well, let's see if I can do it. Da -da 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 -da. Idle is typically at about 
cruise power settings are going to be somewhere between 90 and 95 percent RPM. And we're talking RPM here, not fuel flow and not thrust. And then we could have 100 percent RPM, which is the red line or takeoff power setting. And this 90 to 95 percent is going to be cruise. We might have at idle. a TSFC of 0.5 and at takeoff we might have a TSFC of 0.6 and at cruise which is where we're going to operate the engine the vast majority of the time the TSFC might be 0.4 and of course where do we operate the engine at most of the time cruise so where are the engineers going to design the engine to be the most fuel efficient where we're going to operate the engine most of the time at cruise wow it's like I knew what I was talking about so typically takeoff and idle TSFC's are higher and the lowest TSFC or the best fuel economy is at cruise RPMs now that I've done a you know a couple of TSFC problems, you ought to be able to do the ones that are in the blue pages in section Bravo Bravo. Kinetic energy equals the weight of the air that you've accelerated times the velocity squared, and all of that is divided by two g. Ke stands for kinetic energy. So if you break it out and put in some words instead of the variable symbols, it's weight times velocity squared over 2, which is a constant, 2 times acceleration due to gravity. In this class, we're going to do everything in feet and seconds instead of meters per second. It'd be like 9.8 meters per second squared is the acceleration due to gravity in the metric system. OK, if we crunched some numbers in here, if we doubled the weight, if we doubled it, then what would happen to the kinetic energy? Well, these other items in here would all be staying the same, so if we just doubled it, then the kinetic energy would double. But here's where you got to watch out for. The velocity is getting squared. So if we doubled the velocity, then we're now going to square it. So the end result would be that kinetic energy would go up by a factor of 4. We doubled the velocity, but how much energy it took to get that done went up by a factor of four. So if we have a choice on designing a jet engine and we want to double the kinetic energy coming out of the tailpipe, you know, double our thrust, would we double the weight of the air that we're accelerating through the engine or would we double the velocity? Yes, that's right. We would want to increase the weight. Yes, if we increase the weight of the air so we can get more thrust, certainly we're going to increase the kinetic energy the same percentage-wise. But if we increase the velocity, it's not going to... We could double the increase of velocity, but it's going to cost us lots and lots of energy. And so typically you're going to find that jet engine development has figured out ways to affect a greater weight of air, which of course weight above the acceleration, weight of the air over gravity, that's the same as mass. So we're going to be increasing the mass of the air if we want better fuel economy, because every time we want to add kinetic energy to the airflow, we're going to have to burn more fuel. In fact, we could, one way to describe this would be to say, forget this, forget this, and let's just say fuel needed. Maybe that helps. Now fuel needed, we're not going to increase the velocity to get more thrust because that will dramatically increase how much fuel we need. Instead, we're going to concentrate on the weight of the air, the mass of the air. Now, we're going to do that by putting a fan on it. I'll give you an, show you an example here. Let's say we've done that turbofan thing, so let's see if I can draw 
a turbo fan. Everything the turbo jet's got on it. Oh wait, but we need extra turbines so we can drive that big ol' honking fan out here and of course we're going to have a duct. And certainly we're going to have core air. And we're going to have the bypass airflow. And we're going to be getting thrust from both the exhaust pipe and, of course, from the fan. Both of these we're going to get thrust due to the mass of the air times the change in velocity. And we're also, at the same time, going to be getting thrust from the area of the jet nozzle, or it could be area of the fan, times the differential or change in pressure. Interestingly enough, this big old honking fan out here, it accelerates a very large mass. So for the fan, you could say that, let's see, here we go. Let's try it like this. The fan is going to develop thrust through both of these ways. We're going to get thrust due to mass, but since it's huge and it's going to be sucking in a huge volume of air, it's going to have a very large mass, but it's not going to change the velocity very much. Coming out of the exhaust pipe or the engine core, it's going to be developing thrust due to accelerating a mass, but it's going to have a large mass and it's going to have, however, a large change in velocity. So looking at that kinetic energy formula, what does it tell you if we're affecting a large change in velocity but we're not changing the mass very much? That's going to take more kinetic energy, that's going to take more fuel. So the reason that turbo fans, high bypass turbo fans, having a bypass where we have air that's not going through the core, it's bypassing the engine core, is that we're going to affect now with the fan a very large mass and only change its velocity a little bit. At least this right here compared to that, this velocity is going to be much less than that one, but this mass here is going to be a lot greater than this mass right there. Now, certainly, we're also going to get thrust from the engine core due to a small area of the jet times a change in pressure and in the fan. In fact, we could put core down here, thrust from the core and thrust from the fan or we could call it bypass, it doesn't make any difference. We're also going to have, a, but now, a very large area of the jet, and we could say the duct is just a jet, times a change in pressure. So it's not that we aren't going to get thrust from change in pressure across the area, but the reason why turbo fans with a high bypass ratio, with a big ol' honking fan, get better fuel economy is that when we double the mass of the air to double that amount of thrust, we're only having to double the fuel flow. If we doubled the velocity because it was only a turbojet and we didn't have a fan, then it would quadruple the amount of fuel flow. So the higher the bypass ratio, the lower the TSFC, the better the TSFC. The more we bypass air from the engine core by having a big giant fan, TSFC gets less. And less lower TSFC is better fuel economy. Okay, turbojets. I just essentially explained this. If we have a turbojet, if we got a turbojet, all of the thrust It's coming in this direction. All of that thrust comes from the engine core. There's no bypass, so the thrust due to the engine core is going to, whoops, the thrust on the engine core is going to have, we're going to affect a small mass, but we're going to have a big change in velocity. So it's going to be compared to a turbofan, where a turbofan, 
it is developing some of its thrust from a large change in mass times a small change in velocity. So compared to a turbofan, turbojets are more dependent upon velocity, a change in velocity. And of course, a turbojet only extracts enough energy out of the exhaust to drive the compressor. We got the compre to compressor, combustion chamber. We don't have that extra turbines. We can let that extra energy go up the tailpipe. The only amount of energy that these turbines have to extract is to drive the compressor because there's no fan or shaft or prop having to be driven. Now, since it's de de developing some of its thrust from, develop from getting the velocity of the air going through the core to go really, really high, it's going to have the worst TSFC of all of the turbine engines that develop thrust, the turbo shower, the turbo fan, the turbojet, and the turboprop. It's going to have the lousiest fuel economy, that is the highest TSFC. And since it doesn't have a fan or a prop, there's no, excuse me, there's no other place to get thrust except from the engine core itself. Wow, the TSFC on, on turbo, excuse me, on turbojets, the TSFC on turbojets is so bad that nobody makes them any, excuse me, makes them anymore. Nobody's had a production turbojet. Gosh, let's see, they came out in the 1930s, 1939, the Henkel HE-178, it was a turbojet. And nobody started, I wonder when the first turbofan was made. If somebody needs an extra credit uh, project, let me know, because I'd like to find out what was the first turbofan engine ever made, and another project would be what was the first turbofan engine ever to go in production. But make sure you contact me before you start this project. I'll give it to the first person that gets a hold of me. But they stopped making turbojets probably in the 80s. In fact, in the 80s, they had cruise missiles that it were turbofans. Nobody's made a turbojet for a couple of decades for the sole reason that it has the lousiest fuel economy. Turbofan characteristics. 90% of the thrust is from the fan. So if we had a fan and it's driven by, see we gotta have turbines and we got of course we gotta have a compressor and a combustion chamber and a duct. The value of F, the two S, mass times change in velocity and area of the jet times change in pressure due to the core. And here, the bypass, we're gonna have that same uh yeah. Let's let's do bypass, yeah. Net thrust, net thrust due to uh, force or thrust due to the fan would also be, of course in this case it would be a big M times change in velocity. And we have area of the jet times delta P. Essentially I'm saying that FBP plus FBP in this engine is, one t is ten times greater than the FC the FC's added together. So the vast majority, 90% of the thrust, not 90% of the air, but 90% of the thrust comes from the fan. And of course, since turbofans accelerate a large mass of air but only through the fan, but only changes velocity a little bit, then turbojets compare, correction, turbofans compared to turbojets are more dependent upon mass. Now, this bypass ratio. The bypass ratio is talking about how much air goes through the fan versus how much air goes through the core. So one more time here. Here we'll have a fan. Trying to draw my stick diagrams really fast to make sure I put in the extra turbines to extract energy to drive the fan. Whoops. Let's just say that the bypass air is four pounds per second. And the air coming out of the core, oop, I forgot my exhaust pipe. The air coming out of the core is one pound 
per second. That would mean that the bypass ratio is 4 to 1 or 4 to 1 or 4. I personally like using this version right here. It's 4 to 1. That means what's coming through the bypass fan is four times the weight per second, four times the mass per second. So that's what the bypass ratio is talking about. So if we have a, a higher bypass ratio, you know, four to one, you know, better than that would be six to one. The Boeing 777 first engines, the GE 90, it has uh, a bypass ratio of seven to one, and I believe I've read that the generation next the Gen X engine for the 787 is going to have an 11 to 1 bypass ratio. Wow, we're accelerating a huge amount of mass and only having the velocity change a little tiny bit. So that's going to give us lower TSFCs. That's answering it is because it takes less energy to accelerate a large mass and change its velocity only a small amount instead of changing affecting a small amount of mass but accelerating it to a much, much higher velocity. Now, here's one that gets rather interesting. Why are turbofans better at hot and high altitude takeoffs? Well, let's see. I'm going to have to draw a picture here. So, we'll draw a fan. I'm going to have to get good at this, I guess, huh? There's the compressor blades, some turbines, some extra turbines. And there's two ways we're going to be able to get thrust. So we're going to be getting net thrust from the bypass due to a very large mass of air times a small change in velocity and we're going to get thrust from the bypass due to area of the jet which is pretty big times differential pressure. Whoops. We're also going to be doing that out of the tailpipe. We're going to have those two thrusts, mass times change in velocity, and area of the jet times change in pressure. Now, we already discussed the fact, you know, why we get better fuel economy because we accelerate a large mass but only change its velocity a little. But if you look at hot and high altitude days, we're talking about amount of air molecules. Whoops. We're talking about molecules per cubic inch or per cubic foot. The hotter it is, the less molecules there are per cubic inch. The higher we climb, the less molecules there are per cubic inch. This right here directly affects mass. Directly affects mass. So you're going, hey man, well if we're at a hot day, high altitude, why don't turbofans, why aren't they more negatively affected? And so why aren't turbojets better at high altitude? Well, I'm going to tell you why. It's not that mass is, doesn't get affected at hot and high altitude days. It does, but you notice this part of the formula right here, it doesn't get affected at all by how many molecules there are. If we have pressure ambient out here in front of the engine and on the back side of the fan we have pressure in the jet, you know, this we could call this duct a jet, as long as the difference here, as long as the delta stays the same, then we'll be able to get the same amount of thrust out of the fan due to change in pressure as we did before. Yes, mass will be a little bit smaller, so we'll get a little bit less thrust out of that turbo fan when we go to higher altitudes, but if we can get that same delta P across the fan, we're not going to lose thrust in this area, in from this perspective. So, we have a huge area. This fan is huge. So, compare turbojet, this number is a lot smaller than this number is, but in a turbofan, the thrust due to area times change in pressure is bigger compared to mass times velocity than it is in a turbojet. Hopefully that makes some sense. If it doesn't, you'll have to come talk to me some more. So it's not that turbo, so the reason why turbofans have
better hot and high altitude performance is that since they have a bypass ratio and that r bypass has a large area and you get a big chunk of its thrust due to area times change in pressure area times change in pressure doesn't change even when you have less molecules per cubic inch because of hot temperatures or high pressure altitudes a turbofan is still going to be negatively affected by hot days and high altitudes but not as much as a turbojet Now, we're going to talk about, you know what, I'm going to draw you a picture. Tip speeds. And I'm going to see if I can draw this fan sideways. Pretend we're looking down on top of a jet engine. And let's say, here's the duct. And I'll put the engine core right here. I'm not used to drawing jet engine sideways. So here's the compressors. And we've got our combustors and our turbines to drive the compressor and some turbines to drive the uh, fan. And let's pretend we're looking straight down on this engine. Here comes the airflow. And we're accelerating gases like crazy. And let's see. What's going to happen is that we're going to have a certain amount of air coming in through the engine, through the fan, and it's going to be have a certain velocity. If we use the length of this line to represent velocity, we'll say that this is, say, 500 knots. For instance, at cruise, at altitude. Also, this blade is spinning. So the blade, as it comes around, it's going to have, of course it's curved, so it's going to have a tip velocity which if you weren't moving forward would be just this line but since we have to take into account the fact that the air engine is good the blades are going through the air at a certain speed and a certain tip speed vector that we add to it because the blade is spinning around and around then we can actually add these two vectors together Ooh, vector addition without a calculator sweet hopefully you'll notice that this is the longest line Effectively, that means if we take into account the relative wind and we take into account the tip speed due to rotation, the a if we had bolted a pitot tube on the end of one of these blades, it would be measuring this airspeed right here. Well, that means that even though we're not coming up on Mach yet, we could actually have this tip coming up and hitting Mach 1. Now you're going, yeah, so what if we go Mach 1? Well, if you look at drag, if you look at drag on a subsonic airfoil compared to Mach, and we'll say that right here is 1.0, and it's a subsonic airfoil. And you got to remember, these airfoils, these fan, does it have to work really well at takeoff when you're going zero knots? You betcha. When you're going 100 knots on the takeoff roll, yeah, these blades need to be able to work well. So these blades are subsonic airfoils. So if this is a subsonic airfoil chart graph, drag at zero is going to be zero, and it's going to increase and increase, and it's going to start going up exponentially as we get close to Mach. So guess what's happening right here just before Mach, as we're approaching Mach, the drag on the, these blade tips are getting higher and higher and higher. If we put a duct right next to these blade tips, then we can control very carefully the airflow at the blade tips and keep this drag lower. The reason why turbofans with really big diameter fans can go so fast and not have so much drag that we're spending fuel in the combustion chamber to blow turbines around to extract energy to drive the fan to counteract drag is because we've got these ducts. If we have ducts surrounding the fan then we can reduce the blade tip drag and spend our fuel on thrust instead of spending our fuel on overcoming drag. So that's this one down here. Whoops. Yeah. So we can go faster than we're going to be able to go near Mach 1 
and if you look at uh, fighter jets, they're going to be turbofans. Fighter jets these days are low bypass ratio turbofans, and they'll certainly go above Mach 1. Turboprops. Just like a turbofan, the amount of thrust you get off of a turboprop, 90% of it, of that thrust, is coming from the propeller, and 10% of the thrust is coming from the core. Now these are that 90%, that's a very generic number. Every engine is going to vary, but that's a really good number for the test, and it's a good number to remember as a general rule. Now outside of this class, you'll probably find few, if anyone, that talks about propellers having a bypass. But the reason I'm saying in this class that propellers have a bypass ratio or have a bypass is because the, the theory of getting thrust and TSFC, fuel efficiency and all that, is identical between a turbofan and a turboprop in that if we have a lot of air being accelerated, a lot of mass of air being accelerated by the propeller and we're only changing its velocity a little, then we're going to get better fuel economy than if we accelerated a small mass but change its velocity a lot. Turboprops have a much, much higher bypass ratio than turbofans. Like I said a little while ago, yeah, the brand, a brand new 747 back in 1969, a 747-100, the engine, the bypass fans on that had a 4 to 1. 1996, or whenever the 777-100 went into service, those engines had a 7 to 1 ratio. 2008, or whenever the Boeing 787-100 is going to come out, those engines are going to have 11 to 1 bypass ratio. Guess why they're going to higher bypass ratios? Because it's better fuel economy, lower TSFC. We get that portion of the thrust due to mass. Keeps We get higher mass and we keep changing the velocity less and less and less. But look at that. Even an engine that hasn't flown yet has a bypass ratio of 11 to 1. Guess what turboprops are? How about 25 to 1? How about 30 to 1? It varies quite a bit. But these bypass ratios already are far greater than that of a turbofan. Not like you're going, oh wait, Mr. Johnson, look, 11 to 1, 25 to 1, this has twice the bypass ratio. Does that mean it burns half of the amount of fuel? No, I wish it did. Check out this graph. We'll see if I can draw this graph. And we're going to have TSF, whoops, let's not draw that one, TSFC. This is going to be TSFC, which lower is better. And here we're going to have bypass ratio. And it's going to start out and it's going to come down and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. That's true, but it keeps getting smaller at a low rate. That's a really lousy, <laughs> gosh, that's a really lousy line. Let's see if I can try that one again. Oops. It's still getting smaller, but if this right here is 4 to 1, and so, tw you know, let's go to 7 to 1, 7 to 1, and we go to 11 to 1, you know, we can come all the way out, way the heck over here at 25 to 1, but this distance right here isn't half of what it is over here. That is, this is not a straight line. If we had a nice straight line, we'd have a linear curve. We could double the bypass ratio and cut the TSFC in half, but we can't do that. This curve isn't straight. So yes, 11 to 1 will be a great bypass ratio. So that means that we can dramatically improve the TSFC on a turbofan engine but it's ne I won't say never. It's going to take a long time before turbofans are as fuel efficient and have as low a TSFC as turboprops do. But turboprops have an issue, which we'll get to here on this slide, that may make it so you're going to want to have a turbofan quite a bit of the time. So, super high bypass. We're talking 25 to 1 or greater. That's going to give us, you know, that 25 to 1 
or more is going to give us the lowest TSFC if we want to compare a jet, a fan, or a prop, a turbojet, turbofan, or turboprop. The turboprop is going to have the best fuel economy for pounds of thrust. Now, it's going to have the best hot and the best high altitude takeoff performance for two reasons. One of them is because of these two reasons. One of them, it has a higher bypass ratio, just like a turbofan is better for hot altitudes and take a hot day, high altitude, ha, uh, hot day and high altitude takeoffs are shorter in a turbofan than a turbojet because you have a bypass ratio and you need that differential pressure, which is not affected by the mass of the air. You get that with the turboprop, but in addition to that, there's a second reason. Can you think of what that is? What do turboprops have that turbofans don't? Yes, you're right. They have a prop instead of a fan. And there's one thing that a turbo, the propeller on a turbine engine can do that nobody's mass produced on a turbofan, and that is variable pitch. Those variable pitch propellers, the variable pitch propeller is like having an infinite gear ratio. If you want to go fast, you can have high pitch. Here's a propeller, and here's a reasonably high pitch. If you're going fast, you can have that propeller, and of course here's the engine. Whoops. And the propeller is going to be rotating in that direction. Or you could have the propeller at a low pitch for low forward speeds. So on takeoff, you can be in low pitch, and that's just like being in low gear, like first gear in a car. And as you go faster and faster and faster, and the relative wind is coming faster, this blade can move to a higher pitch. So it's like having the perfect gear ratio all the time, even when you're going five or ten knots. So that's the second reason why turboprops are better at hot and high altitude takeoffs, because if there's less molecules per cubic inch because it's hot, or there's less molecules per cubic inch because you're at a high pressure altitude, then the blade can go to a higher pitch to take that into account. And you get the shortest takeoff rolls also because you can have a variable pitch and you can have the exact perfect uh, angle of attack on the blades even when you're at slow forward speed. So I guess we ought to kind of change this into three. The three reasons. The three reasons are one, we have a higher bypass ratio even than a turbofan. Number two, we can change blade pitch to be optimum even if the air is hot and there's less molecules per cubic inch, and even if there's less pressure causing less molecules per cubic inch, we can go to a higher pitch as needed. And when we're at the third reason is that when we're at really, really low speeds, we can let the propeller stay at a low pitch and get just the exact angle of attack that we need off of that relative air. And as we go forward in speed, the blade can go to a higher pitch. Wow. I even, I learned something today. The downside to turboprops is that you're always going to have that heavy gear reduction. You're never going to have a turboprop. Never going to have a turboprop. Make sure I get the extra in there. You're going to have that heavy reduction gearbox in here to drive the propeller. It's okay. It's worth it. Your TSFC, you save enough weight and fuel that it far exceeds the extra weight of the gearbox. Now the downside is there's going to be a little higher maintenance costs, but still the reduction in fuel costs due to burning more fuel even offsets it. Now here's a good one. Why is efficient efficient six tenths to sound? Whoops, went too far. All right. Let's do this again. Let's put our turboprop as if we're looking straight down on the turboprop. I don't know. I'm not used to drawing engines like this. Compressor blades, combustion chambers, turbines, and some extra turbines to drive the propeller. The exhaust is coming through. Of course, we have bypass air going through. Whoops, I don't want that one just like it was on a turbofan this whoops
just like it was on a turbo fan, this velocity of air, the relative wind, if the length of this line is based on the speed, and this propeller is rotating. So this propeller is going to have a curved uh, air speed or tip speed just from its rotation. If we add those two lines together, then we're going to have the longest line be if we vector add the velocity of the forward speed of the airplane to the velocity of the propeller tip. And you got to remember, these propeller tips, they're going up there close to the speed of sound. So once again, if we're talking drag on a subsonic, you've already drawn this one, so it works for turbo fans and for turbo props, subsonic airfoil, and we have drag versus Mach, it's going to go up. You know, and if here's Mach 1.0, guess what? Somewhere in here, at about 0 0.6, it goes up faster than it did before. The rate of change is not constant. The rate of change is increasing. At some point, you know, the area under here is a whole lot more than the area of under here. So Mach 6 is a generic number. It's not an absolute perfect number. But if you look at the top speeds of turboprops, you know, at, uh, at high altitude, Mach 1 is 574 knots to airspeed. If we multiply that by 0 0.6, let's see if I can do this in my head, 6 tenths of that, that ought to be somewhere about 400 knots. So let's see what I get. 4 times 6 is 24. 7 times 6 is 42 plus 2 is 44. 5 times 6 is 30 and 34. Okay, I can live with that. So that's this 574 knots. That's Mach 1.0 minus 56 degrees Celsius. So we're going to be looking at turboprops to be fuel efficient and not have too much drag because the tip speeds, this this is going to be subsonic blade tip. Blade tips is what we're talking about. We're talking about drag on the blade tips. If the blade tip starts coming up on there, then we're going to get a lot of drag. So the forward speed, this line right here, might only be 344 knots true airspeed, but this line right here, since we had to vectorally add it to the rotating speed of the blade due to it spinning, this up here is going to be coming up on Mach 1. So we're going to be hitting the drag right in here just before Mach 1, even though the forward speed of the airplane is only around Mach 0.6. So it, can you go faster than 0.6? Yes, you can, but the drag on the blade tips is going to be too much to be fuel efficient. So if you want a fuel efficient turboprop, you're not going to design it to go much faster than 0.6 at cruise. Turbo shaft characteristics. Once again, heavy and complicated gearbox. Let's so draw it down here. See if I can remember how to draw a, a turbo shaft engine. Lots of compressor blades. Got to have turbine blades, and we got to have enough turbine blades. Then, in addition to driving the compressor, we also have to drive the reduction gearbox and provide power to our output shaft. The place, the two places you're going to find. Uh, turbo shaft engines on airplanes or <laughs> on airplanes on aircraft one of them is helicopters to drive the transmissions that drive the rotors and the other place is you're going to find them is on big jets big turboprops yeah, big turbine helicopters uh, big biz jets big turboprops transport category jets is this output shaft can be used to drive an AC generator uh, the H-60 Blackhawk. It's a big helicopter, two-engine, twin-engine, turboshaft engine on a Blackhawk. It has an APU on it, and that APU drives an AC generator. Guess what? You know what? That output shaft, it also drives an air compressor, and it pulls air in, and it blows it to the engine starter motors, the main engine, main engine starters. So that's very typical on transport category jets, you know, big old jet airliners, big biz jets, big turboprops, and uh, large turbine helicopters. That APU does two things. It provides alternating current power, electrical power from a generator, and that output shaft drives uh, a pneumatic, drives a, a compressor. So you can use that compressed air, that pneumatic power.
that pneumatic power to drive a pneumatic starter. So we can drive helicopter transmissions and we can drive APUs. Now, interestingly enough, turboshaft engines are a little different than turboprops. You probably noticed that they look a lot alike, except for the propeller bolted onto the end, is that if you're going to design an engine from scratch with a turboprop, it's very likely that fuel efficiency is a little more important than weight. You're going to go up there, you're going to fly for hours, so if you can shave off 50 pounds of engine weight, it'll pro uh, but it costs you an extra 100 pounds of fuel you're not going to do it because the airplane will have to carry you save 50 pounds on the engine but you had to put an extra 100 pounds of fuel on it because you're going to burn so much fuel and so you're not going to do that so what you're going to do is you're going to allow the engine to weigh 50 pounds more and not burn that extra 100 pounds but for helicopters flights are shorter for APUs you hardly ever run them in the air so it's not the fuel efficiency it's how much does it weigh if you have a helicopter engine if you've got your turbo shaft helicopter engine and let's say instead of being 500 pounds you can design it to weigh 400 pounds but now the fuel flow for a typical flight goes up by 50 pounds because it's not as fuel efficient because you are you didn't design it into it you shaved off 100 pounds but you only added in 50 pounds of fuel you have a net savings of 50 pounds so on a typical flight you can carry 50 pounds more of cargo or payload or heck put 50 pounds more of fuel on it and go farther so for turbo shafts one could argue if you took the propeller off of a turbo shaft and a turbo prop you could argue that there was really two big differences one of them is they designed turbo shaft engines where weight those reducing the weight of the engine is more important than re than improving the fuel flow reducing the TSFC the other is that turbo shaft engines are not designed to have thrust it's not that they don't blow air out the tailpipe but you don't take that into account helicopters need power to the transmissions and APUs need power to the generators and the air compressors and how much thrust you get out of the tailpipe blowing is not taken into account for practical purposes for practical purposes we are going to say for this course that turboshaft engines do not produce thrust unducted fans I'll show you a picture of an unducted fan I got one right here Inductive fan looks a whole lot, if we were going to do stick diagrams, they look a whole lot like a turboprop. Make sure I put the extra turbines in there to drive. Whoops, to drive. It's going to have a heavy and complicated gearbox, but the shape of the propeller, we're talking scimitar shaped propellers. And the ones they've, they, they've made, if you General Electric has made some, one, Pratt and Whitney has, but you'll notice with the relative airflow if you look at a transport category airplane a big biz jet you notice they have swept wings what's the purpose of those swept wings yes that's right it's to reduce drag at high subsonic forward speeds wow can you dig the swept blades so essentially an inducted fan gets better fuel economy uh, that is lower TSFC's because it has less drag at high subsonic so we can go mock point eight and we don't have too much blade tip drag but since we have this super high bypass super high bypass it's got the bypass of a turboprop then we can start getting significantly better fuel economy because this propel this these propellers which is you know another way to call it is an inducted fan has a super high bypass to give so our TSFC goes down but we're allowed to fly high speeds because we don't have to have the blade tip drag better TSFC because we have swept blades allowing crews to mock point eight and still be efficient this really had to read swept blades allow efficient crews to Mach 8 and the sweat blades cause lower drag at Mach 0.8 than props would and of course the down one of the downsides is the heavy and complicated gearbox but we'd save a lot more fuel than the weight of that thing the big downside is that it makes a lot of noise
Now, uh, Pratt & Whitney and General Electric actually made um, prototypes and bolted them onto the side of the airplane. We'll say, here's the side of the airplane, and we'll put this engine on the back of the fuselage, which is where they put them. The problem is that the noise hitting the airframe would go through, and people sitting in chairs right next to here, it was amazingly loud. Could they do something about that and put extra insulation in there? Sure they could. Guess what? This noise hitting the airframe right here was vibrating the metal so much that it was causing the metal to fatigue and going to crack early. Could you take care of that by stiffening up the metal, using thicker metal, using better metal? Sure you could. But you know what happened? Why they decided not to put, okay, this is my opinion, not to put uh, unducted fans into production. And the reason for that is that if you're flying along at altitude and you got this unducted fan and noise comes down, and hits people sitting on the ground near the airport as the airplane's coming in to land or the airplane's taking off there's no way to get rid of this noise in here and so it was going to be amazingly noisier to people on the ground than turbofans and FAA noise limitations or why unducted fans haven't gone into production. Now there is, although I say on this slide that no have gone into production, there is a, 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 a turboprop or unducted fan airplane made in Russia and it's, it's kind of like halfway between a turboprop and an unducted fan but it makes so much noise it's illegal to fly it into the United States. If you have any questions about this section, Jet Propulsion 2, please get a hold of me. I'll be happy to answer your questions. If you have any pr improvements on how this lecture could have gone better, please feel free to let me know, and I'd love to incorporate improvements into successive lectures.